OK, so um, welcome everyone to the spotlight. So um, if just in case anyone doesn't know, these are all kind of highlighting projects that were funded by the iNote project. Um, um, so iNote is a project with our Atlantic University partners, GMIT and Letterkenny IT, and it seeks to provide opportunities to transform the higher education experience in the whole of the ATU. And um, the specific role of IT Sligo in that is the development of online learning student support services model. So today um, we have Dr. Tamsin Caviero and she's a lecturer in the Department of Social Sciences here in IT Sligo and she's also a trained graphic facilitator and she's joined uh, today by Jennifer Gilligan, an instructional designer with the Centre for Online Learning here at IT Sligo and today, today they're going to talk about a um, graphic facilitation course that they have run for staff um, at the end of last uh, last academic year and last semester as well. Um, I'm just going to turn over to you now um, to tell us how that went. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. So I'm just sharing my screen now. Um, is that visible to everyone? Yeah, it's visible yeah. to me. OK, Tom. Yeah. OK, so hi and welcome to our presentation on digitalising graphics for teaching and learning. So as Alan said, my name is Tamsin and this is Jennifer, my colleague. So um, just to give you a little overview um, of what graphic facilitation is, um, graphic facilitation uses a variety of visual approaches to capture big ideas, map processes, engage audiences and present information clearly. It allows you to visualise problems and come up with solutions. Approaches can vary, but all combine words and pictures. And graphic facilitation helps to engage students and encourage retention by building confidence, encouraging and widening participation, fostering a sense of belonging. It creates a space for reflecting on the student journey and reflecting on the learning process, improving concentration and listening skills, and making note taking enjoyable. It provides flexible pathways into education for non traditional learners as well. So, graphic facilitation methods are used by agile and scrum coaches, change initiators, software engineers, healthcare planners, and community organizations. Um, thanks, Jennifer. So, this was funded by the iNote project. So, um, Jennifer is an instructional designer, and myself, so I'm a lecturer work together to design and implement um, an online graphic facilitation digital badge module for academic support and professional staff at IT Sligo. The graphic facilitation module was developed to benefit lecturers and um, professional support staff in using principles of universal design for learning within their teaching methodologies, specifically through the principle of representation in order to support IT Sligo students. The focus was both on campus and online students, but because this took place during the um, COVID restrictions, the module was delivered in a fully online format. So the purpose of the module was to provide participants with a set of practical tools that staff could use to digitally enhance and customise their own specific work practices, such as customising slides, Moodle pages and tiles, research mapping, conference planning, setting visual agendas and offering student support. Um, so graphic facilitation can be used in online and on campus environments. So activities were designed for both environments and were introduced and explored through the online module. So the initial course was offered over a 10 week period to 16 members of staff, and this included 12 teaching staff three um, professional support staff and then one professional support staff from the Insurance Institute of Ireland. Twelve of the participants were women and four were men and the lecturer participants were from business, engineering and design, nutrition, life sciences, marketing, tourism and sport, computing, social sciences and science. The professional support staff included instructional designers, online student advisors, um, e-learning and educational development specialists and clerical officers. And motivations for doing the course were focused on engaging and supporting students. Participants' length of time in employment in IT Sligo ranged from four to 28 years, and all participants were full-time members of staff. 
the participants' online expertise vary considerably. So some staff members had very little experience of using Moodle and had only begun teaching online in the previous semester, whereas others had considerable online experience. So obviously during the time period of delivery of this module, all teaching was 100% online. Uh, levels of teaching range from people teaching level six through to level nine and people, the sort of numbers that they would be used to. So student numbers in classes range from 15 to 120. And just to give you an idea of the modules that were taught by the course participants, they were things like ethics, creative practice, strategic management, insurance, maintenance and safety, communications, applied drama practice, social justice, environmental legislation, nutrition, biology, anatomy and physiology, disability sport inclusion, health and fitness, nutrition and performance, weights instruction, personal training practice, research supervision, personal development, chemistry, forensics, analytical science, programming, electronic and autonomous vehicles, structural engineering and design and accounting and finance. So a big range. Weekly sessions were recorded and uploaded to the Moodle page so that participants could continue to practice with the videos after class. And the Moodle page also provided participants with an idea of how to reformat their content to make it as student-centered as possible, aligning with the UDL principles of representation. So working together, we created a 10 week module that included weekly live online drawing sessions and a dedicated Moodle page that housed all the practical supports and resources for participants. For me, working closely with an instru instructional designer allowed for a reflexive space that enabled us to create a facilitating learning environment. Each week, participants were provided with a nativity to prepare for the class. They were then introduced to a new skill which was demonstrated in class and they're invited to practice together. Classes were delivered on a Tuesday evening and then every Thursday we had a two hour meeting where we, re we reflected on the activities and the learning and made adjustments necessary for the next week. This method allowed for a flexible and responsive approach to the module which took into account the diverse needs of the participants and the range of the abilities. And building in time and opportunity to reflect from our diverse perspectives allowed us to capture those alchemical moments in teaching as they occurred and to respond appropriately. This was carefully balanced with having a built in structure beforehand, and this allowed us the freedom to experiment with creative approaches. Making time to forge the lecturer instructional designer relationship allowed us to combine structured pedagogic approaches to learn from each other and to draw on our strengths. Um, <clears throat> so then in terms of the module design, um, making remote participants feel included and engaged would be challenging without preparation, planning and a sound framework. We had to consider how we would design a module that would run equally as successful if we were to return to the classroom as it would if we remained teaching it online. Equally, what if we were some were return, returning to face to face learning and others needed to remain online as participants? Due to these circumstances, the decision was made to design the entire course around activities combined with a related and intertwined live class. Activities devised by Jilly Salmon focuses on the student. They overturn the idea that learning depends on one expert and they are based on the idea that knowledge is constructed by learners through and with others. The activities had four core functions. Draw out prior knowledge, allow an application of new knowledge, prepare the participants for the live class, and then to allow participants to showcase their knowledge with the rest of the group. By following this framework, we created the first three to four activities in advance and then devised the rest on a weekly basis upon both observation and learned behaviours. This meant that we followed an agile approach, ready to change or drop an activity immediately and devise a new one based on our participants' needs. The assessment strategy was simple, the creation of an e-portfolio through Microsoft Swathe. The e-portfolio was gradually built by the participants through the activities. 
Frequent check-ins and verbal feedback encourage participants to work weekly on building a collection of graphics. This method also meant that all hand-drawn graphics were now digitalized in one place. Building a graphics e-portfolio is an authentic assessment. The participants acted as graphic professionals building their, their collection of graphics for future use while developing meaningful and applicable digital skills. We could see immediately positive results from linking asynchronous activities and synchronous activities together. The linkages between the two were important as there was a distinct advantage to carrying out the activity. It provided the background and practice for the live class. Referencing and using examples of asynchronous activity by Tamsin into the live class helped to merge the significance of participating in both environments together. A method of think, draw, share, discuss was used in the live class. This approach involved a period of time for students to reflect on a metaphor, for example, draw an image to represent it, and then share that image live. A discussion of the image would take place where new ideas were explored and the sense of a variety of interpretation was observed. An example of a follow-up activity was to make a recording demonstration of how to draw a particular graphic that was practiced in that live class. This method combined the use of technology with drawing skills. Elements that contributed to the success of the module were the social interactions, initially through the activities and then via the live class, the mix of staff across all disciplines, the syllabus being presented through graphics instead of text, the advantages of designing a module with lecturer and instructional designer working together, participants becoming co-authors as we observed their interactions, the use of technology through application, the use of activities, informal live classes, weekly forum posts which reflected back to what had been previously covered and projected forward into the next activity. We used humanizing activities such as asking participants to create their own graphics for their virtual backgrounds and teams. Concept mapping, problem solving and reflection through the use of an online Miro board. Feedback provided through multiple modes of representation and continued conversations. For example, in our final live class, we used a Miro board to create a persistent chat and a collaborative space outside of the live class. The Miro board really encapsulated the final rep, uh, reflections of the group and served as feedback for further iterations of the graphic facilitation module. This is a space that all participants can return to at any time as they use their skills. The feedback that we received from the participants is really interesting. This is what participants had to say about what they would like to do with their new skills. I hope to use this in both teaching and assessment. I hope to convert some of my lectures into graphics, particularly case studies and scenarios. I would also like to try graphic facilitation within assessment, perhaps, perhaps asking students to convert a topic into a graphic or into sketch notes. I will incorporate my graphics into my Moodle pages. I would like to use my new learning as part of my reflective work for my PhD. I'm including graphics and materials and signposting in my Moodle pages. I'm often asked to chair meetings and it would be very useful to use this approach for one of my meetings and workshops. When back, when back using real flip charts, I intend to use graphics. I can use it for research and dissemination with staff. Over time, I would like to think about how I would use it with students to develop their skills. I'm thinking of using it within emails to online students. So in looking at the reflections, what we really learned was how to measure the success of what we carried out. Some participants' interests were in, in improving the delivery of their content to their students 
and they weren't necessarily motivated by gaining the digital badge. The participants' ability to seek out knowledge afterwards because now they have an established relationship, meaning they have a clearer understanding of the role of the instructional designer. We have just ran the second iteration of the module and have extended it to members of community-based organisations, ETBs, professional and academic staff from IT Sligo and the CUA. We firmly believe that the broader, broader mix of participants adds value to the module. We are currently rolling out the, the module to IT Sligo students as part of further development. As part of recruitment for the module, we asked academic staff that have already completed the module to nominate students that they believe may have an interest in using graphics for their, for their work. Further strengthening the lecturer student relationship through the understanding of representation through graphics. And that concludes our presentation. So we can take any questions. If anyone has anything. That's great. That's great. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry, I've got a bit of an echo there. Um, if anyone wants to come on, Mike, or um, put a question in the chat, um, please do now. <laughs> Um, if not, um, I was just wondering, like you kind of talked a lot about the reflections there and it's really interesting to see the different kind of approaches. Um, did, did that kind of differ in any way or change like from the initial motivations of people coming into the course? Like what were they hoping to get from it? Because it's kind of, um, it's probably not a new concept, but it probably is new to a lot of people. Yeah, so um... Ellen, you also haven't disclosed that you've done the course as well. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah, I think when they first came in, they, I think, um, what I found in the second cohort, we talked about this a lot actually, was that um, sometimes people struggle with thinking about how they can apply it to their um particular type of learning so i think like i come from social science background so i would give lots of examples of that but i think what works really well is because you have the mix of different um backgrounds in there that gets sort of kind of served as a spark for different ideas for people to think about oh yeah well maybe i'll use it like that i could try that in an assessment or or even like um in the first iteration we had people thinking about well how can i send out um information emails to students from support staff and things like that so i think it did yeah definitely it developed and we found both co to the, the two cohorts are very different as well that's what we've noticed so I don't know, do you? Yeah, I, I thought that what was interesting was we, we really collected it formally or not formally, but um, through the Myra board at the end, we mm. sort of, I think every week we always ask them to apply context to what was being presented to them. So um, Tamsin was really great at representing different metaphors, for example, or different ideas, and she was thinking about the audience all the time. So she was trying to balance between academic and professional staff. So not everyone was teaching. So there was other like administrative um, applications that could be used. So she always tried to give ideas. But what she done was gradually step back from that and ask them every week to apply their own context to something so that they were sort of forced into thinking more about their own situation. And then at the end, by giving them the my reward, they really got to see what was the end result, where everybody was thinking about using it from different areas. Um, and what was really interesting was to see the variety of even the interpretation. So coming from different, not only different, um, job roles, maybe different perspectives on things, different environments, because we were all um, also in lockdown the first time we ran it. Um, we were very limited in terms of our environment. And one of the exercises was to go out and look for something or tell a story was another one. <laughs> and it was really hard. We all found it hard to tell a story because nobody had any news because nobody <laughs> had left the house. <laughs> and we had to draw you know, an adventure or something exciting. We had, we, we all had lovely ideas around what we used to do before COVID and nobody <laughs> had anything new we had done recently. 
um, which also added, I think, to the, you know, the real social aspect was we were being prevented to socialise and we really gelled as a group because that live drawing together, there was a lot of relaxation. In fact, Tamsin introduced some music at one stage and we all felt really comfortable with each other and that creative process became a lot easier once we gelled as a group and we felt relaxed. So there was a lot of dynamics, I suppose, a lot of things came together. Um, but as Tamsin said, we're now able to compare it to a new version, which is our new group uh, of staff. And then running with students starting tomorrow, um, it'll be really interesting to compare what they're going to apply it to as well. Yeah, and definitely like since Tamsin brought up that I did this course last semester, the social aspect of it was brilliant. And like I think anything, like I was very interested to do the course and in the subject matter but I think a little bit of you kind of like oh god I'm so much work on and how am I going to fit this in and like you know kids and stuff but was, you really look forward to it every week like it's um, really interesting but also like just very enjoyable way to spend an evening and um, Martin did you have a question there yeah hi thanks um yeah, thanks a lot. hey Thompson so hi Jennifer Ellen. hi Martin uh, so I haven't been on the course, but maybe I should disclose I've started working with Tamsin last week. Um, so, and so I've got to see, you know, the very effective way that the Tamsin utilises art, you know, in, in, in her work and um, teaching materials. Uh, and I'm really keen and enthusiastic to, to engage with this. And I, but I just wonder, is, is, did you encounter any issues with like, you know, like sort of basic drawing skills? You're no, welcome. that's a that's a really good question. So I say this at the start. I hadn't actually drawn until I about two or three years ago. I'd never drawn, and so that's something that is really important to kind of highlight in graphic facilitation that you don't have to have any drawing skills. And I think just like Jennifer said in the first few weeks. So I say the first, definitely the first four weeks of the course is me showing you how to draw. So you draw with me. So I'm actually drawing. You can see it happening on the screen and you can literally copy it. So from a kind of teaching point of view, you're kind of really carrying people for the first four weeks, just the, the around that. And then you find actually it's really just lines and shapes and it's just adapting them. So um, like I'm actually quite nervous about the one with the students because lots of them are from art backgrounds, but people who've done it who have done training in art have often said it's a very different way of working you know so um i think it's again it's just learning a skill but no not at all you don't have to have any art training at all great thank you just when you mentioned the the students there kathy and um, o'kelly has a question in the chat box there about how students can um access the course she has some students who've yeah. expressed an interest in it so so this one sold out so sold out for this session but the, we, what we're planning to do is run um, every year run one for students and one for staff now what we think this just to explain the first time we ran it we ran the staff one in this semester didn't we in semester two and then in the second iteration we ran it in semester one what our feelings were was that um, semester one isn't great for staff because it's very busy and that semester two is kind of a better one for staff so we may actually flip it around so it may be um, not 100 percent, but we're thinking that we'll run the student one and then run the student one again in September and the staff one in January so that would mean that these students Kathy your students they could um, contact Elaine Smith and let her know um, they keep Elaine and Neve they keep a kind of waiting list and then um, when it goes out they could have the name on the waiting list for the next iteration so we're thinking that will probably be September for the students. Great are there any other questions for Tamsin or Jennifer? Okay. Um, yeah so just um, I suppose thank you for for the presentation. Really good overview. And um, uh, I was one thought as well when you were talking about the kind of structure of the classes. Um, that was kind of. Do you think that really fed into how um, the aspect of how successful the peer learning aspect was? Like that seemed quite purposeful. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely we spent loads of time talking about that and thinking about it and. Each week we'd kind of think about like Jennifer had me so up to speed on nativities. I was like, oh, God, I don't know. But we really thought carefully about 
you know, if something happened in the previous class, whilst we, we had an idea, we actually adapted the activities each week. And then from that, we'd then kind of um, try and, you, you probably remember, Ellen, we'd, we'd try and kind of get people to start to get confident to post up their own images and then start teaching each other. So, oh, how did you do that? Or um, can you show me that? Well, that's inspirational. So that's definitely, that was um, an, an intention, wouldn't you say, Jennifer? Yeah, and, and sometimes people were ahead of me in terms of digitalizing their work. So where I was doing it one way and I thought I was being clever and efficient, um, everybody was trying it every which way that they thought it should be done because um, we sort of left it open that it was more about hand-drawn than being good with technology and the technology came afterwards. So it wasn't important at all to have any um, software. In fact, none is needed, only Microsoft products like Outlook and Paint. So by using those two, um, people were able to just take a photograph of what they had drawn and then digitalize it by uploading it. Um, and then I started making videos on how to, we'll say, enhance the digital version, take out the background or color it in. But people had come up with great ideas themselves. So, um, you know, one one or two weeks there, like Tamsin handed over the mic to a couple of people and they demonstrated how they brought in their images or how they added color and um, shadows. So actually, like it was really collaborative and it wasn't it definitely wasn't about anyone being an expert. Um, you know, it was about guiding people and letting them figure out things and then sharing it with others as well. And through that process, I was able to make some new videos based on what the best way to do things were. But I learned a lot from everybody that that done the course as well. And um, so it was it was all everyone thinking like, you know, the, everybody was um, contributing to the content, actually. Yeah. And actually, one thing just to say there was that you then um, inspired me to try. So I then started in another in one of my classes with students. I then the next year when I ran the tutorials, I used a uh, sway format. And so one of the things I did in the tutorials was we used that series of questions. So they would present through peer learning something I've done that I'm pleased with, something I've done that I struggle with, and something that I figured out. So we ran that through tutorials and actually we both ended up learning loads about sway from the students figuring out stuff that I hadn't realized myself so that and they actually said as well that what they found useful from that was watching each other figuring out because there's loads of different ways to do things so I definitely think that's a really helpful part of it yeah I think someone was saying that like it's sort of like your washing machine you know you like use the one setting on it like the whole time and there's all those other things that you just don't have a clue about yeah. um, but I thought, yeah, the, the great thing about the activities is they weren't like particularly onerous or anything, um, but it kind of got you to reflect prior to the session on, you know, what you were going to be doing that week or, you know, where you were with your work and you were kind of more in the frame of mind to be, you know, to contribute and kind of be a, like a, an active participant in the in the session. So I thought that was really good. Um, and uh, yeah, so unless anyone has any other questions, uh, I think we could probably wrap it up there. So thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks a million. Thanks a million, yeah. Great. So I'm just going to end the session there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.